another episode of Artist Spotlight, the podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Stringer, and of course, we are brought to you by the Maryland Photography Alliance. In this episode, I get to talk to a gentleman I've known for well over a decade, very talented commercial and sports photographer, Sean Hubbard. Sean uh, lives in Baltimore, and he is one of the uh, team photographers for the Baltimore Ravens. His work is really noteworthy, and during our talk, Sean gives some terrific insight for many who aspire to become professional sports photographers, as well as people who just want to improve their imagery. And I think the way that he has bridged the the distance, if you will, from sports photography to commercial is really, really something to, uh, to behold. And he really does an excellent job kind of breaking down his thought process, gives listeners an understanding about what it is like to prepare and shoot a game day, not only before but after the game. And it's really, uh, really quite a walk through what a day is like uh, for an NFL photographer. So I hope you enjoy my chat with Sean Hubbard. I'm pleased to be joined today by Sean Hubbard, a Baltimore-based commercial photographer, sports photographer, and one of his many accolades is he is one of the Baltimore Ravens team photographers. So, Sean, thanks for joining us. Oh, Mitch, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. You know, I first became aware of Sean a number of years ago, uh, shooting the Ravens as I do. I see this guy darting all over the field uh you know, the players are stretching the players are in some cases praying before games and, and who's there at their feet who's there next to them behind them from the side and it's you and i thought this must be the most aerobic centric photographer i'd ever seen uh you know it was almost like the old snl skit with sprockets if you remember that where they would dance and, and do all so i just thought this guy is so incredibly athletic in the way in which he goes about his photography and you know i, I realize it's it's about angles and it's about capturing moments that are not the the norm that we see what what got you into looking at some of these different perspectives to make some of your photographs uh, I guess a number of things, you know, um, you know, I have a background as an athlete and um, kind of knowing a little bit about what it's like to be on a team and making sacrifices to pursue something like that, sort of the successes, the failures. So kind of going deeper than your typical action shot, trying to help tell the story of the athletes that I'm photographing. And then I think also just wanting to be different. Um you know, I, I do have really good access uh, with a lot of the work that I do, especially with the Ravens. So, you know, my goal has always been to use that and and that you would not think I'm just a sideline photographer. And, um, you know, I feel for the guys that have to stay around the white lines and 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 kind of shoot with the same lens and, and can't move around as much. And I've always um, I've always held that, you know, with a tremendous amount of respect and responsibility that I do have access. So. Uh, I want to take full advantage of it, and I want to show the people that are interested in my photographs a perspective that they can't really get anywhere else aside from what I do. Uh, and and just to maybe for our listeners, let's go back kind of to early days because I know when you know when you see somebody who is has an occupation that a lot of people will find aspirational, they will wonder how did this person get their start. Um, and, you know, the, the listener may be photographing their child's games in high school or, or rec leagues, et cetera. And, you know, they see you out there and others out there. Uh, you know, I, I know in 2004, you graduated from Penn State. Um, uh, you know, how, how did you begin, you know, this journey and how did it get to where you are really one of the preeminent pho photographers in the NFL now? Yeah, well, my story is definitely a bit uh, non-traditional, and and maybe that might provide some hope to those with a non-traditional background at any stage of their career. Um, you know, I think maybe if you were to sum up like what the typical path of a of a sports photographer or a commercial photographer may be is, you know, going to you know art school, having a very well accomplished portfolio in college, maybe you won you know photographer of the year in college. Um, and then you go and you assist, you know, an established photographer and, and spend some time assisting and kind of learn under established people and then kind of get your opportunities and they build. Uh, and that was 
that was not really how it ended up working out for me. I mean, I did study photography a little bit at Penn State, but it wasn't a full on traditional photography program I was doing at the time, you know, film photography, black and white, just f- kind of fine art stuff. Nothing with a real purpose behind it. Certainly nothing that would establish a career. Um, but that's what I was doing at the time. Uh, right after school, I uh, pursued an opportunity that I was a little misleading. I thought it was for a studio photographer and ended up being sort of like a school and youth sports photographer. Um, but I was a couple weeks out of school at the time and I thought, hey, I'll start making a paycheck. Um, but I was literally doing yearbook photos one day a week. And then the next day a week, I was shooting uh, youth football league photos, action photos. I learned how to be a sports photographer by shooting um, sports action photos of mainly elementary and middle school kids, not even high school, certainly not college. And I, um, you know, I was doing that for a while and things just kind of snowballed. I, said, I could certainly draw the story out uh, quite a bit, but I, Happened to be photographing a youth football tournament at uh, Raven Stadium at the time. This was in 2006, I think. Um, And uh, I ran into an acquaintance of mine that I knew from college. He, at the time, was the youth marketing coordinator for the Ravens. Uh, He he said, no, we have like sort of like a team photographer. And then we also hire freelancers sometimes to shoot our youth events, things like that. Would you be interested? You know, verbally, I said, yes, absolutely. In my head, I was like, well, I'm, I'm so not qualified for this. Uh, you know, I didn't have a well-rounded portfolio to, you know, so I actually just took pictures from that day of like kids playing football at MIT Bank Stadium and made some prints and sent them in and, and they really, uh, resonated with the people in the marketing department and, uh, things just kind of took off from there. 17 years later, here I am, uh, obviously my roles and responsibilities with the team have increased pretty much on a yearly basis. And then, you know, my commercial career took off, um, a bit after that as well. You know, there are people who I've spoken with as I've given talks or just informally, and they say, you know, I wish I could make pictures like this or like that, you know, whether it's, you know, one of yours or mine or one they've seen. And, you know, what what I've what I've expressed to them is you don't have to have access to a professional level sports team to make really compelling images. And, you know, you you really opened the door to this thought for me, which is how really shooting any type of photography can inform a different type of photography. photography. So if you're photographing Little League, it could be 10-year-olds, but the angles in which you choose, the moments in which you anticipate and choose, those can be every bit as dramatic as a Lamar Jackson picture that you might make because it's all about the image and the moment. And, you know, when, when you talked about how your studio work kind of, uh, informed and led you to a fuller understanding and giving you more ideas about how you went on to do what you do today, maybe expand on that a little bit so that a listener would, would understand how what they're doing that weekend, you know, could really be brilliant. And they don't have to be on an NFL sideline to make an impactful image. Yeah, absolutely. And what it really comes down to for me is is a compelling story. And uh, to think that there are only compelling stories and emotions in the NFL or at certain a level of any sport would be pretty naive to think. Obviously, um, there are incredible, important stories to be told at every walk of life, every corner of life in Baltimore, outside of Baltimore. And I think if you go into any situation, whether it's, you know, for a client or for yourself, if, if your goal is pursuing a story, um, that's really what's going to be compelling about it. Obviously, it does go hand in hand with being able to tell the story in sort of a creative way, you know, sort of articulate the story visually. But like you said, like there's just as much emotion in uh, a kid's game than there is a, a, in an NFL game. There's certainly the stakes are higher, but you know, tell that to that kid who's trying to, you know, make the varsity squad or whatever. So I think um, if you're, you know, I've always just been interested and gravitated towards e- emotions and emotional imagery. And it just so happened that that landed me in, in the ath- uh, athletic realm. Um, but yeah, aside from, a cool camera angle or, or a f- photographic technique. I think the story is what makes things resonate. Certainly you have these graphic images, which maybe aren't 
emotionally evocative that are like just cool for it being artsy or whatever. But um, my goal is to kind of go behind that. Certainly I want to be creative, but if you can combine the creativity with storytelling and emotion, I think that's really where you make the magic happen. And that can happen in any realm of, you know, of sport, you know, for example, a few years back, uh, you know, a personal project I did on the St. Francis football team, which is locally, uh, I did that just on my own. It's a high school program. And, you know, that, that awarded me a lot of opportunity. I've licensed those photos. It's led me to, led to other work. Um, another personal project I did was on a predominantly black uh, ice hockey team in Baltimore a few years ago. And I shot that just on my own and uh, just some incredible stories there to tell. And I pitched it to the New York times and it ran as a double truck spread on this in the front, you know, the sports page of the New York times uh, of just a personal project of youth sports so, you know, it's pretty easy for me to be able to say that, that there's compelling stories to tell, whether you're dealing with professionals or, or kids or amateurs or anything in between. You know, I, I've had people say to me, you know, when the Ravens have a 1 p.m. kickoff, they'll say, what do you get? They're about 1230 noon for a one o'clock kickoff. And of course, you know, I kind of laugh. So, you know, for, for those, the, the uninitiated, maybe walk through uh, like a high level timeline of you know, the game is at one o'clock, you know, when do you get there? Kind of what do you do to prep? And then when the game is over, be it at the stadium or be it in your office post game, kind of what the what the timeline is to to shoot a game and kind of close the door on that game having been shot and those images from that specific game, you know, being being done. What, what is that? What does that look like for you? Okay, uh, sure. Um, and it's obviously varies a little bit from like a home game to an away game. But for home game, for example, it's a little bit easier uh, to articulate that timeline. Uh, I basically leave my house. I, I live in the city, very close to the stadium. So I leave my house four hours before game time. So it's a one o'clock game. I typically will leave about nine o'clock um, to get over to the stadium. Uh, I spend a little bit of time just prepping my gear. Um, but from about three and a half to two hours before the game, all I'm photographing is players walking in the stadium. So uh, social media ha and and sports fashion have sort of like partnered up in the last couple of years and, and everyone's very interested in what players are wearing and the fashion that they have. So uh, I, I just kind of hang out in the, in the service level of the stadium and take pictures of guys walking in. Um, I'm transmitting those via Wi-Fi transmitter to the social media team who is going to make social media posts uh, in real time. Uh, the players technically have to be in the locker room two hours before kickoff. So at 11 o'clock for a one o'clock game, I then transition out to the field where um, players will begin their sort of pre-game warm-up. So some players have already been out there. Some guys come out really early. Some guys come out late. But from, from say, 11 to 12, it's players in their sort of sweatpants, and tank tops, you know, out there doing their, their kind of pre individual warm up, And, um, you know, th this starts a time of, of creativity for me, um, and a bit of freedom, uh, and I'll go forward and backtrack a little bit on the timeline, but, you know, once, once the game starts, you know, I am confined as far as access goes to where everyone else is in the sideline. I'm using a very long lens. You, you know, you can't really control where the action goes and you're just kind of hoping it comes close enough to you to, to capture it. Um, so while that's, you know, it's great, um, you know, I'm very limited creatively, like as, as far as what I'm capable of doing, whereas like pregame, I can go wherever I want, essentially, um, you know, I have a good rapport with the players that I photograph and, and they know how I work. I established that, you know, early on when, when guys come to the team, I, you know, I work closely with athletes. I, I feel like, um, you know, I, I, famous photography quote is if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. And I'm a firm believer of that. And again, using that access. And so, um, yeah, I get close. I use I use wide angle lenses, of, you know, mostly primes where I'm able to move around instead of zoom lenses uh, that I use during the game because that's the action sort of unpredictable. Um, I'm more intentional with what I can do for pregame. So, you know, so, yeah, 11 o'clock that starts about an hour before the game is when the official team warm-up starts where they're, they go into the locker room, they get their uniforms on, they come back out and they're doing their full team, um, team warm-up. Um, and then obviously then, you know, kickoff is at one and games are typically, you know, three, three and a half hours. 
and um, head home after the stadium. I, I, I generally photograph, I would say anywhere from 9,000 to 12,000 images per game. Um, away games are a little different than home games. Um, for instance, uh, we just went to Cleveland this past weekend. I, I, I shot 12,300 some images. Um, so for, for a home game, you know, I go home, you know, I, I, before I do, as soon as I walk in the door, I put in my media cards to start offloading. Then I'll typically take a shower, get some food. Cause I haven't eaten since, you know, nine in the morning or eight in the morning. And then, um, then I just begin the calling process. So that's using photo mechanic. That's going through all the images as quickly as humanly possible. And I'm not trying to pick like the best 20. I'm just trying to pick any image that I think I'll ever need ever again, because um, the rest I throw away after about a year. Uh, so I just want to make sure I get everything that I think could remotely be usable um, whether it's a great picture or I just know I may need that, like, oh, this may, this player may ask me for something or what have you. Um, as far as timeline goes on that, you know, like I, so when we were in Cleveland, I photographed at 12,000 images. Uh, the flight from Cleveland's pretty short. Um, in about an hour, a little over an hour, I got 12,000 images down, um, to about 1400 on the flight home. Uh, and I probably could have done a little quicker. I was talking and typically when I'm on the plane, like people are looking over my shoulder and like, Oh, that's a great image. And, you know, so it's, it's not, it's like full, full on, uh, hustle mode, but, um, and then, you know, I'm still actually, you know, so today is Wednesday. I'm still working on those images. Typically I try to have them done by Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, and that 12,000 went to 1400 and I generally deliver between three and 400. Every, again, every game's a little different. If, it, if the game's a real stinker, it may be, you know, 300. If it's a game like we had in Cleveland, it's probably going to be over 400. Obviously, the better the game, the longer the runs, the more pictures you're going to take. So um, I try to, you know, I basically give the Ravens a, a gallery of about 80 to 100, 100 images, again, depending on the game. Like as soon as I can, it's a couple hours after the game. And those are, you know, my best images of the game that I think tell the best story of the game. And then, like, like I mentioned, I try to have all the other images say 300, 400 to, to the Ravens within about 48 hours. Wow. Yeah. That, that it's, you know, so that, that really paints the picture in terms of, you know, for approximately three hour game, your game, so to speak is, is literally, you know, three times that in terms of the, the time commitment, you know, right. this, this podcast is not gear centric, but for those who are listening when they're, you know, either watching on television or they're, they're live at a game and they see a photographer shooting the NFL, one of the, the questions that many have is, what lenses does that man or woman bring to shoot that? So, you know, I'm not so worried about the, the brand because nowadays all the brands are great. But from a lens perspective, what lenses do you have on you? And does that really differ pregame, as you kind of described, versus during the game or are all of them with you all of the time in case you have a need? Yeah, so I am a gearhead. Um, I think, you know, it's possible to make compelling images with any gear that you have, but um, I, I know that I have very specific ideas and a very specific look that I want to achieve in certain situations. So, um, I have a lot of different gear that enables me to do what I want when I want to do it. Um, and also because I not only photograph sports, I do commercial work and portraiture. So I have lenses that I need for each, but that I end up using for both. So it, it, it works out really well. So yeah, so there's a big difference pregame versus during the game, uh, pregame, um, I'm generally using prime lenses because I can move around. Uh, those are sort of very shallow depth of field, wide aperture lenses, like, you know, 1.2, 1.4, 1.8, uh, that allow me to clean up really busy backgrounds. As you know, like the NFL sidelines is one of the busiest backgrounds you could possibly imagine. So obviously there are certain things you can do compositionally to try to clean that up, but that's not always possible. So uh, being able to simplify the backgrounds with a shallow depth of field is something that I, I try to uh, do quite a bit. So for pregame, you know, I, I mostly, you know, I have three camera bodies on me. Uh, typically, it's a 35 millimeter, a 50 millimeter and an 85 millimeter. Uh, sometimes I'll swap that 85 for a 135, um, which allows me to get nice tight portraits of like players on the sideline during the national anthem or whatever. Um, I do certain times, like I'll, I'll have my 
16 to 35 on my belt, uh, even for pregame, because sometimes like I can get kind of like in the huddle shots, which the 35 millimeters is not quite wide enough. Um, but I really like those are the lenses that I'm using for pregame. And then once the game starts, all those lenses go in my bag. Um, and that's when I use my super telephotos and my zoom lenses. So uh, during during the game, I have three camera bodies and four uh, lenses with me. So I have my 16 to 35 around my neck, my wide angle during the game. That's probably that's for sure my least used lens. It's really in case something just falls into my lap. Um, you know, that I'm, I'm covered for that. Uh, my next lens, uh, which I wear down at my hip on a black rapid strap is a 70 to 200. That's my mid range lens. That's basically any time the play is in between, you know, uh, the 20 yard line in the end zone. I have that lens up for, you know, touchdown shots. Again, zoom lenses allow you to kind of deal with unpredictable action. Um, and then my super telephotos, you know, I have a 400 and a 600, which I have one camera body that I, I alternate between the two, depending on how far away the action is. Um, but those, again, aren't zooms, but those are your traditional NFL uh, game day lenses. I used to exclusively just use a 400 pre-COVID. And then um, once COVID happened, the NFL expanded the sideline uh, footprint so that players had more room to move about. Uh, and unfortunately, that took away um, spots for photographers to be on the sideline. So everyone's further away now and that that didn't go back once you know COVID, COVID, the COVID precautions cleared up so um, I do have a 600 now and I actually probably photograph more images with the 600 um now with that than I do with the 400. Yeah I, I can remember during kind of the the heart if you will of COVID and I was um, I'm shooting from the stands because there were no there were really no fans there were maybe some family but uh right. yeah and my, my, my 600 was a very frequently used, even a 200 to 600, I was using more so the 200 for uh, scoring plays if I was, you know, in that part of the field. Mm -hmm. So now this isn't literally another side of your brain, but you've talked a lot as, as you've kind of given your background about creativity. And so, you know, what I want to explore a little bit is your commercial work, because, you know, for, for the, the those who are listening so, so many times people are very focused on a particular genre and you have managed very well to not only have success in sports photography, but also, and I'm going to use the word parlay and you can tell me if that's incorrect, parlay that into commercial work. And I say parlay because I'm assuming that most of your commercial work and, and the, the broader success you had came after you started working uh, with the Ravens and that may have opened some doors and then your talent kind of took it from there. But, you know, maybe talk about what you can do photographically and creatively with your commercial work and sort of where that departs from the sports work and creates a whole new realm of creativity. Yeah, for sure. I mean, primarily with the work I do with the Ravens, it's photojournalistic in nature, it's storytelling, it's documenting team history. Um, so there's only so much influence, you know, I can have. Now, if you see my Ravens work, you know that I go beyond sort of like typical photojournalism uh, because that's not just what the team asked for. Like, so I'm documenting historical moments and doing that in a very, um, you know, a way that I'm not heavy handed with. And then when I'm making portraiture, I may be using a prism in front of the lens or, or even in my post-production techniques because, because the Ravens aren't just looking for photojournalism. They're looking for marketing images. They're looking for images to sell this brand and to attract attention and, and use these images commercially. So um, I think, you know, as much as my, my love for documentary photography, you know, I'm a perfectionist at heart and it's really hard to achieve anything close to perfectionism when, when you can only have so much of a role in the image making. So I really enjoy being a fly on the wall, but at the same time, I love the opportunities that I get where I can really uh, direct, you know, uh, what's going on, you know, and have creative control. And I, and both of those outlets are very important to me, um, you know, because I just, the, the different styles that I, that I like to, to work on. So um, I, you know, yeah, for sure. Like I started with the Ravens. So I had a lot of, you know, my athletic work is what was the work that was predominantly being put out there. So, you know, that transition into getting exposure to photograph, you know, athletic work for commercial clients for advertising. And it definitely opened some doors for me um, in that regard. Um, I, 
I've, photog- I've also photographed for some other sports teams in the same way that I photographed for the Ravens. So um, all that sort of built little by little. And, you know, when I started with the Ravens, I was really inexperienced. You know, I, I, I look back on the first couple of years and, and it was a lot of, it was a lot of on the job learning how to be a sports photographer so I didn't really do it traditionally, you know, as maybe other photographers who went to a, like a photojournalism school did. Um, but, you know, and even when I started with the Ravens, I was the marketing photographer. So I was shooting ads for them, um, you know, lighting things and and right, right off the bat. So I was doing both early on. And then, yeah, that obviously transitioned to some opportunities in the commercial space to do both. I mean, even, you know, like I do documentary work that's te- technically commercial work. So it, just because, you know, an image is photojournalistic. Or if it's lit with 10 lights, either one, you know, can be quote unquote commercial work. Is there, you know, in, in, I guess in the commercial work that I've done, especially for clothing brands, the the clothing is the star, the shirt, the sweater, the hoodie, the hat, that, that that's the star. And then the person is, to, I mean, it's a sort of a bold way to say it, but a human mannequin, <laughs> a human mannequin and the product is what they're wearing. A lot of the things that you have shot or at least some of them are, you know, af- athletes who are maybe not known. So an athletic mannequin, if you will. But you've also shot very well-known athletes and very well-known people where probably, well, not probably, they, as much as what they're wearing, has equal importance because they're effectively endorsing that hoodie, sweater, hat, shorts, whatever it is. So when you were lighting when you're posing, when you're, you know, in that creative space, how do you balance the relative importance of the outfit with the brand name person, as opposed to the outfit with the relevant model, but not a a name that we all know, because for example, if you had Michael Jordan, easy example, you don't want it to be vague who that is. You want it to be known. Michael Jordan's wearing that sweatshirt, whereas someone else you know, they need to look, you know, nice and appropriate, but that it's Michael Jordan isn't relevant because it's Sally from Des Moines in a sweatsuit. So how do you balance that level of importance when you're setting up the shot or kind of thinking through what that needs to look like? Yeah, well, the balance comes just from meticulous planning ahead of time and establishing who the hero is, right? So before you you have the shoot, it's like either you have to, and and, and it's no mystery, like whether you're working with an agency or a client, it's, it's, okay, you know, we're working with college athletes and the clothing is the hero. We're working with, you know, Aaron Donald of the Los Angeles Rams and, you know, he's the star of the show and the product is there, but it's sort of secondary. So just establishing that beforehand and, and occasionally, you know, there, there is a balance, but going into it, you have a pretty good idea of what you're there to sell. Right. You know? Um, and then, yeah, obviously, so you go in with a plan and then obviously organic moments happen where, you know, the, the subject, comes more into focus versus the product and, 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 or, or, you know, and say, okay, well that still works, even though like originally the product was the focus, but this is more about the athlete. So I think just having a good game plan about what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to sell ahead of time is the most important part. And then, like you said, um, you know, and especially those times when you are, you know, highlighting a product like clothing you know, when I'm working with athletes, you know, my first goal is always, if it's, you know, obviously if they're doing, you know, athletic things is to have it look authentic. Um, and so I try to just tell them to do what you normally do in this situation. Obviously, it's much different for an athlete uh, to come in on set and recreate, you know, sort of the intensity of an in-game moment, right? So that's, it's very hard to achieve that authentically. So a lot of times you're, you're, you're taking what they give you and then you're tweaking um, their technique to, to be more photographically pleasing to the eye. And then, you know, but a shot where you have an athlete doing something and you can't see the logo on the shirt is obviously it's, it's not worth anything. Right. So no matter what, if you're selling the product, you have to make sure that you can see the logo or you can see the texture in this fabric. So lighting, how you position them. So the, the lighting is hitting it right. And then just, physically where things are lining up in the frame and okay, well, I know this is, you know, what you would normally do, but we can't see the logo. So I need you to do it this way for the picture. So um, again, it's just about defining what you're trying to show and then using, you know, posing 
direction and and light to showcase that the best. You know, that that makes that makes sense. So what what kind of I guess uh, sage words of advice could you give to the aspiring, whether it's a young photographer who you know hopes to follow in footsteps similar to yours, or or you know get to be a, a professional sports photographer, or maybe someone who is a hobbyist and really wants to uh, improve their sports photography? What what uh, advice would you have for them? Yeah, you know I get this question all the time, and it's it's always tough because. I feel like there's like an obligation to provide, um, you know, uh, career changing advice in, in, in a simple way. And, and unfortunately, you know, there's no there's no simple way to that I can give a one sentence of advice that's going to alter somebody's career. But I think things that, that constantly come up um, is one getting closer, you know, like get as close as you can. People, you know, there's a disconnect when you're using telephoto lenses versus when you're using a wide angle lens is that. When you use a telephoto lens, you feel like a spectator. And when you use a wide angle lens, you feel like you're there. And when you feel like you're there, you have a deeper connection to the images. So if I'm using, you know, if I'm in a locker room and I'm using a 200 millimeter lens across the locker room and zooming in on a player's face, you can tell the difference than when I'm kneeling down before the player with a 35 millimeter lens because it feels like you're there. It's more of a real situation. So whenever you can get closer, uh, by all means, do that. I mean, I think that's like a technical thing. And then I think one thing that I've been thinking a lot recently is like, I think we all generally grow in this industry with these sort of like rules and parameters as far as, you know, you know, the rule of thirds and mergers and all these things that there was these like 10 things that you can't do if you want to make a successful image. And I guess what I've learned over the last couple of years that it's all BS, right? Like, you know, I, 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 I see so many images, especially in the commercial space that I think, well, like, oh, well, like that's a merger or that's bad composition or, or it's out of focus and they're major ad campaigns and no one cares because at the end of the day, we're not, we're not, um, we're not photographing rules. You know, we're photographing people and emotions and feel, you're trying to produce a feeling and it doesn't matter what the rule is if you can't feel anything. So like I've, and I'm, and I'm a rule follower, I'm a perfectionist and I love a good rule. Uh, ask my kids. Um, <laughs> but you know, I've, I've sort of like been like breaking down these barriers and, and, you know, instead of doing things that I think that other people like, I'm just doing things now that, that, that I like. Um, and that doesn't have to be like, you know, people have, if you've looked at, you know, if you follow my Instagram for a while, like I've had a number of people like more recently, like, I feel like there's like a, a change in, in, in your style of work. And, and yeah, I just like, I'm, I'm not caring as much anymore what people think I'm, you know, like your images are grainy now. Like, well, yeah, I like grain. I feel like that's, that's, I'm putting grain on my images. Like, you know, I, I deliver, you know, whether it's a Ravens or another client, like I'm delivering what they need, what they ask for. And then what I use and what I want to do, I'm just being creative with and, and doing, you know, cropping things untraditionally or, you know, what have you. And I think so, the biggest advice I could give now is like, don't get caught up in these rules because um, in sort of the commercial space and in real life, like no one really cares. It, it, it's about creating a feeling and a connection with your images um, and tying into that is, um, you know, being different and standing out, I think is probably the most important thing um, with the advancement of technology and um people have access to really good equipment. Like you said, all the brands now are great, right? Like people ask me like, what, what camera do you use? What lens? And it just really doesn't matter. Like everyone's got access to good stuff and being able to take a good photograph is no longer a skill anymore. It's like, it's common. It's expected. Um, what isn't expected and, and what sets people apart now is creating an image that stands out. How can you make someone stop scrolling? And you know, like, and, and that's like kind of like undefinable thing. Like what's different? Well, I don't, you know, it's, it's different. You don't know it till you see it. So I would say, you know, try to develop a style that is particular to you that people will seek you out for that style because uh, so many people, you know, create images that are great, but they all kind of look the same. You can't really, couldn't tell who shot what. So, and it's something I'm still working on is creating a, a definable style and creating imagery that stands out for one reason or another that is going to stop people in their tracks. 
Well, Sean, I want to uh, thank you again for taking time to be on Artist Spotlight, the podcast. We'll put the links to all your uh, social media so people can follow you. And uh, early this season, as it is now, we'll look forward to seeing you on the sidelines. Great talking with you. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Mitch. I appreciate it. Great talk with Sean, and I hope that all our listeners got a, a great deal out of that. For those of you who'd like to follow Sean on social media, he is at Sean underscore Hubbard on Instagram. You can check out his work on his website at Sean Hubbard Photo. And to see all things Maryland Photography Alliance, go to mdphotoalliance.org. If you'd like to see what I'm up to, you can check out my work and my most updated information on Instagram. That is at Mitch underscore Stringer underscore Images. And you can also check out the website at MitchStringerImages.com. Lots coming up uh, in terms of future episodes and lots coming up with the Photo Alliance. So we hope you can join us and be a part of it. Until next time, Mitch Stringer saying, keep shooting. Take care.